Time for the fan favorite segment, the fan zone on the touchline on Y25. A very good afternoon and welcome back. My name is Maxwell Wasik, of course, giving <coughs> a focus on international football with main priority to the fixtures of the weekend as far as European leagues is concerned. Remember tonight, El Clasico, Mouthwatering Clash beating Los Blancos, Real Madrid against the Catalans of Barcelona. Happening at 10.45 p.m. East African time and just before that, North London derby, Arsenal, after their victory in midweek clash, 5-1 demolition against a team that beat Chelsea Football Club 4-0, that's Bournemouth. And now they will be looking forward to, you know, glitter uh, and repeat what they did in midweek and probably beat Spurs, which has not been doing either well. I have seen on social media platforms they are being referred to as Bottlers FC after being beaten by Burnley and by Chelsea consecutively. It's the fans on and my panelists are already in the studio. We're going to dissect into what is happening. Moses Gowie is joining us. Moses, have you been, man? I've been good. Long time you are here, some time back. Yeah, nice to be back on the show. Nice um, to be back. Looking forward to quite some interactive debate. Cheers, man. Uh, Tiras uh, Wayaki, the big man, is sitting pretty middle at the park. How have you been, man? Very well. Thank you for having us here in studio. <coughs> I'm the only man with a mic around, so I'm the DJ, not you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy with the mix. <laughs> you must be wearing so many hats. Football coach, bandit, now DJ. Lover boy as well. <laughs> <laughs> and Webster Mwangia National Band. Webster, how have you been, man? I've been okay. Thank yeah. you for having me again. All right, we're going to speak about Antonio Valencia. He announced yesterday that he, he'll be, you know, leaving Man United after 10 years of service at Old Trafford. I don't know, Moses, starting with you, what do you remember the uh, Ecuadorian for during his time at uh, Man United? I know he started as uh, number seven, playing on the flanks, then Sir Alex Ferguson tried to you know, bring him behind to Blair as a right back. He's been at the captain. He's the long-serving member right now as you speak alongside the likes of Ashley Young. What can we remember Antonio Valencia for? Um, one thing with Valencia is uh, consistency. He's been a mainstay in the Manchester United team uh, from the Alex Ferguson era to, through to the Louis van Gaal era, through to the Mourinho era. So he's been a steady uh, fullback for the team. He's performed reasonably well, won a few trophies for Man United. And uh, consistency is one thing I remember him for. And uh, also he converted from a, a forward wing player yes. to a defending player. And he's mm. really done himself good at United. Yeah. Wow. Tiras, mm -hmm. what do you remember Antonio Valenza for? Despite that, uh, besides that horrendous injury suffered, you remember that? Yes, when one of the guys at my local where I usually go watch football refers to him as Picky Picky. Mm. Because the guy really runs, as our friend has just said here. And he maintained that high status of running on the flank football that Manchester United is known for. Dennis Law did that in previous years. David Beckham kind of did it in, in previous years on the right flank as well. And Valencia lived up to that pedigree of running football. He wasn't much of a dribbler, so he would just run straight with the ball. And I think that's why he earned that nickname, Picky Picky, from that guy at down my local, because he just goes like a tuk-tuk, straight. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who's <laughs> in his way. The it obstacle be, ahead. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He'll come straight at you, and he's very brave. And the fact that he was also able to play at the back and sort of still come forward just tells you about his passion, his loyalty to the badge, and the fact that he was also given the captain's armband. Now, that says volumes about him, given that he's not vocal, he doesn't get much media coverage, he's not the kind of guy who'd sell newspapers, the press loves someone the hype who, man. who's controversial, the, the hype around. No, it just it shows about his leadership qualities, also in terms of maturity. So his absence is going to be felt in terms of play, but not in terms of hype because he was never part of that hype. Webster, in football there is talent and there is hard work. I know Antonio Valente is one man who's been gifted through hard work and being industrious <coughs> on the pitch. He's not exceptionally talented like several right backs. But what can we remember him for? And does he need a farewell? Yes. Sort he, of a testimonial match? A, yes. He's had a respectable career. Uh, the first time I laid eyes on Antonio Valencia was during the 2006 World Cup, if I'm not wrong. Then he was signed by Paul Jewell, either Paul Jewell or Steve During that Bruce. time he was at Wigan Athletic. Athletic. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was signed into the Premier League by either Paul Jewell or uh, Steve Bruce, one of them, I can't remember. 
and uh, he was a marauding winger he makes those aggressive runs down the left the, the, down the right hand side and he had a nasty nasty shot from distance then he came to man united he had to adjust to the style of play and you know he had he also i remember he took the number 7 shot and i think it became i think the 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 expectations you know united the number 7 shot is an iconic shot uh, George Best wore it, Beckham wore it, Ronaldo has worn it. So when you wear that shirt, a lot is expected. And after one season, after two Premier League title wins, he reverted back to his old number 25. So what enabled Valencia to become a fullback is his tenacity, his positioning, his awareness. And uh, these are traits that South Americans normally have. They're very dogged, they're very rugged doesn't matter the position they play but they normally turn up if you want if if you fight them they fight you back if you want to play they'll outplay you if you want to run they'll outrun you if you want to out if you want to work they'll outwork you so uh, it's no surprise he became united's captain he was one of the leaders in the dressing room his experience has proved valuable so he he uh, on uh, I'll, I'll 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 back him here and say that uh, his his overall his experience his leadership will be missed, but uh, he was not much of a flashy footballer. For him, it was just getting the job done. Yeah. Another headline with regards to international football is the firing of you know Cloud Puel from Leicester after a string of you know bad results are now being replaced by a man who was at Liverpool before, that's Brendan Rogers, And a lot of coaches, as we speak right now, have been fired, even at Fulham, Claudio Ranieri. I don't know whether it was by mutual agreement as it was reported or it was sucking. But what do you make of the departure of Claudio Puel? I know he's also uh, risen through the ranks from Southampton now to Leicester and after poor performances. Of course, Leicester having pulled a surprise to win English Premier League title two years ago. Brendan Rogers, is he the best man to take Leicester to another level and revive their dwindling you no know, standards football wise? Yeah, presently Brendan Rogers has been a very solid coach, uh, wherever he's been. He started at Watford, um, a stint at uh, Reading, didn't do well, too well at Reading, got sacked uh, after six months. Got on to the Premier League uh, with uh, Swansea first, represented really well during Swansea years. He created an identity to Swansea, uh, free-flowing football, yeah. very good play. Swansea used to challenge and uh, eventually <coughs> became a mid-table team. Uh, eventually moved to Liverpool and uh, that season we really had that feeling of Liverpool winning something <coughs> in a very long time. And uh, I think it's being replicated today with a uh, club at Liverpool. But Brendan Rodgers is someone the who's one who uh, laid the foundation. Who laid the foundation, uh, got Liverpool back to the levels we are used to associate Liverpool with. and. Uh, he went to Celtic, he's done very well at Celtic, won everything when he's, he's been there, treble after treble for the two seasons he's been, he's been there. And uh, Leicester for him was a good way back into the Premier League, because you see Celtic is a, is a bigger club than Leicester in terms of history, in, ter in terms of stature. But where do you want to manage? Do you want to manage in the sort of farmers' leagues? Uh, we, we tend to associate <laughs> uh, the Scottish League and maybe the French League, yeah. uh, compared to the Premier League where you're fighting against the everywhere. It's where Pep Guardiola is, where your Jagen Klopp's are. Uh, top, top management uh, people at uh, the Premier League. So I think it's a good move for Brendan Rodgers. Uh, Leicester's undoing is winning the Premier League. There's so much expectation again <laughs> for, for Leicester, but Leicester in real sense is a mid-table team. Even Where Spartan, they are right now is where they deserve That's being. where they belong. I, I think so. <laughs> yes. Tiras, Brendan Rodgers back uh, in English Premier League and the sacking of Claudio Ranieri the man has roamed around, he's really wondered. Yeah, the sucking <coughs> of, well, before I get to Ranieri, the departure of Brendan Rodgers from Celtic rather abruptly to Leicester Football Club, that's actually what leaves a bad taste in the mouth of yeah. any ardent and neutral football fan. The way he left Celtic and joined Leicester was not professional. He sort of left them midway and, and joined Leicester. He says it's not his fault. He should have done it in the summer. But the way this opportunity came to him, it was take it, leave it, 
miss it. So take it now while it's still there. And unfortunately, in the nature of football business today, he had to take it. If you put yourself in his shoes, he had to take it. Because, yes, he was managing the top side in Scotland, as our friend here has just pretty much spelt it out. But everyone wants to be in England. It's a prestigious league. It's, it's prestigious. It gets a lot of coverage on television. There's a lot of money in it. And I think the kind of money that was dangled to him and the opportunity itself, being that this is an English Premier League side, was just unbearable. He took it. But from the side of Celtic fans, you can see where their anger and rage is coming from. Mm. This thing could have been done better, but it wasn't done better because of the nature of football. <coughs> there's an open and closed window for players, but there's no open and closed window for managers. When it comes to managers, the market seems to be a bit more free. On the part of Ranieri, I think it was a sucking. And it's rather unfortunate because uh, Ranieri was the, 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 the walk and the talk of football just three odd or four odd seasons ago with Leicester winning the Premier League. I mean, it was unbelievable. Leicester winning the Premier League. They won it under Ranieri. So you start thinking, wow, this guy's future is far from diminishing. It looks brighter than ever. And then he comes to Fulham a few seasons later. And he can't really get them to tick. But I think the problem at Fulham was bigger than Ranieri. Mm. This problem began once they, they got to the UEFA Europa League final in 2010. They kind of... After not, not winning that uh, particular final against Atletico Madrid, which they lost, I think, in extra time, mm. they sort of reached their peak Fulham Football Club. And from there, they started going down, down, down. You could actually see them be, uh, being eliminated mm. from the Premier League. And it happened eventually, I think, in 2014. And then they just got back, I think, in the 2017 season. But they've not quite been able to gel. Even though they've invested properly in the club, they've bought players... Um, the previous ownership is no more. The Mohamed Al Fayed mm. ownership is no more. That you have younger blood in terms of ownership, but they haven't quite gelled, and that's where Ranieri was expected to come in and make it happen. It doesn't always work that way. Rafael Benitez won the most classic of UEFA Champions League finals in 2005 with Liverpool when he turned down, uh, turned around, a three-goal deficit against mm. AC Milan going on to win the Champions League. You look at Benitez and you'd have thought, wow, Benitez has a very bright future. But from there, he hasn't quite been able to make it happen. I know he's kind of doing it at Newcastle United, but he's only just doing it. He's not been given That's much money, though, to that, acquire mm. quality players. Yes, he hasn't. But you would have expected that such a guy would be coaching a bigger club. As opposed to considering Newcastle, the United, profile of his name, considering the profile of, of his past, remember he won the then known as UEFA Cup, now known as UEFA Europa League, with Liverpool in 2001. He's got quite a, a pedigree and he's got quite a CV, but the way the football market happens is that it has such a short memory. Uh, someone said in the previous segment of this show that um, you're as good as your last game, and that was in reference, I think, to rugby. It's pretty much the same in football. Mm. This, this season, you're, you're the talk of the town. The next season, you, you fail like this and you're rubbish. So Brendan Rodgers better do well at Leicester. <laughs> Otherwise, football will not <coughs> forgive him. Webster, the coming of Brendan Rodgers mm. on board, will it uh, raise the profile? Of course, English Premier League mm. has, not been, has known to be prestigious. Uh, its profile is on another level. But now, competitively, uh, with regards to tacticians, of course, we have the likes mm. of Pep Guardiola uh, and uh, Jurgen Klopp, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. How do you make of it? You know, uh, I'm only the only one in this panel who is not impressed by Brendan Rodgers. <laughs> Seriously. You have contrary opinion. Celtic Football Club, I mean, the, score, the SPL is not a competitive league. It's like the Eredivisie. In Netherlands? Yes. It's not a competitive league. Celtic will win the treble and the quadruple. I even saw the banner that this irate Celtic fans unfurled for him. And it said he chose mediocrity over uh, immortality. And they said he's a fraud. He has left them on the cusp of a treble. But it's nothing new. Celtic will win the treble even next season. 
as long as uh, and if it's not Celtic, it's Rangers. The likes of Rangers, Dundee yes. United are not the giving them The likes of Kilmanock and Aberdeen and Matherwell and Inverness <laughs> will challenge, <laughs> but they'll never get there. <laughs> so for me, I'm not impressed by Brendan Rodgers. You he, don't rate him? I don't rate him. He was to win the title in 2014. He didn't. He failed. They bottled it against Mourinho's Chelsea. They had the best chance to do it. They had a 30 goal a season striker in but the But can't, can't, can't we attribute what is happening, the success that is being witnessed at Anfield right now to no. the kind of foundation he put Absolutely in place? Absolutely not. Ask me why. Why? None of those players are there. Suarez is gone. Coutinho is gone. Sterling is gone. You see? Steven Gerrard is gone. Who else was in that team? The likes of Shabi Alonso, Shabi, Yaga Mascherano. Uh, uh, it actually, it was, not, uh, it was not during the Alonso time. It <laughs> was uh, Gerrard, there was Sterling, yeah. uh, there was uh, Luis Suarez, Felipe Coutinho. Yeah, Lucas None of them was there. Lucas Klopp, yes. Klopp has built this team afresh. Sadio Mane, Mo Salah, Roberto Firmino. Apart from Roberto Firmino, who I think was a Brendan Rodgers signing, mm. the rest, uh, Virgil van Dijk, Alisson, Trent Alexander-Arnold, that is all Klopp's work. But don't you the, think the identity in terms of the style There of was no identity. The minute Brendan they failed Rogers. to win the Premier League, actually, had they not appointed Klopp, they were headed on a downward slope. Mm. Klopp came in, breathed new life. You remember when Brendan Rodgers left, Liverpool... Liverpool's future was looking very dark. But uh, Klopp came, introduced a new identity, introduced a new brand of football, the way they press aggressively. I had not seen that in a long time. I only used to see that with Dortmund and maybe Pep Guardiola's Barcelona. <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move on to another uh, headline, of course, the dominance of Barcelona in uh, La Liga. Of course, they beat Real Madrid during midweek in the return mm. leg of Copa de la Red 3 nil, and you know people have talked about Madrid's performance especially after the departure of Cristiano Ronaldo who joined Italian uh, Football League <coughs> that is Serie A with Juventus. Mose, you watched the repeat leg, the return leg of El Clasico and of course it's happening tonight. The only difference is that this is a league clash while the other one was a cup tie. The dominance of Barcelona and the air of uh, Lionel Messi. I know he's been compared. There has been this uh, unwavering <laughs> debate uh, uh, of whether Lionel Messi is the all-time best player globally because we've had several comparisons with Pepe, with Diego Maradona, with Cristiano Ronaldo. But scintillating performance from Barcelona, is it because of Messi factor? Um, the thing with this latest performance in the mm. Copa del Rey is that Messi didn't shine at all in that game. In fact, it was Suarez mm -hmm. and uh, Rakitic and uh, the mm. Jordi Alba who really stood out mm. during that game. So that tells you how much Real Madrid has fallen back. Mm -hmm. So that in a game that Messi doesn't even show up, they still lose 3 nil. I thought it was uh, very well poised mm. when <coughs> they drew at the uh, mm. uh, Bernabeu, 1-1 uh, one, one for, for the first leg. So I thought mm. this other game being at the uh, Real Madrid's home, home tough would be a, a much tougher game mm. for mm. Barcelona. But it proved otherwise. Luis Suarez with two goals, very well taken. Uh, Real Madrid played really well. Marcelo was rested, of course. Much blame has fallen onto Marcelo nowadays since Ronaldo left because uh, there's that debate around Marcelo. Is it a good left back? To, uh, offensively, is very good, but defending mm. uh, very poor. Uh, and Ronaldo mm. used to cover a lot for him in that mm. Real Madrid will concede goals, but Ronaldo will score more goals. Mm. Right now, they don't have a source of mm. goals. And uh, as of dominance of Barcelona, I think it's uh, El Clasico has, has lost meaning since mm. the Mourinho era. <coughs> At least there was, even though Real Madrid used to lose, there was that uh, agitation. There was mm. that. Uh, Combativeness of the likes of Sergio Ramos having very foul tackles on Me mm. Messi, Pepe, several red cards. So there was that drama to it. Nowadays it's just plain old Barcelona <coughs> beating Madrid, no drama, no nothing. So the dominance is just there to be to be to be seen. Mm. In uh, the past ten ten years, I think uh, they played uh, Barcelona won ten. Yeah. I think that's since 2010. Mm. Barcelona won ten. Uh, Madrid have won four. 
the rest have been draws, so you can see clearly there's no competition mm -hmm. there. The, the El Clasico has lost its, its uh, appeal mm -hmm. as it is. The glittering show from Barcelona, do we look forward to another uh, same thing tonight when they lock horns against each other in La Liga now? Can we see Barcelona uh, continuing to stamp authority like they have done before in their previous it's hard to games? Beat, it's hard to beat the same team twice, especially mm -hmm. in as many days, back to back. So really, the onus and impetus tonight is for Real Madrid to rise to the occasion. Mm. Something that uh, we fail mm. to see, and I have mentioned it here before, is just how impressive FC Barcelona were at the back. I know we attempted to look mm. at them, how they scored three goals and how they were mm. clinical up mm. front. But if you looked at their defense, that's something I've not quite seen probably mm. since the 1990s. That's again, especially. It's such a cool defense. It's not that Real Madrid did not have a chance. They had chances. Mm. They blew them. And part of the reason why they blew them is because of oh. the almost near perfect FC Barcelona defense. They leave me speechless. They were so cool. They were so calm. It's like watching the Italy of the 1990s when you had guys like Franco Baresi at the back, you would never know that Italy were really, really under attack because these guys would be so composed and they have a chemistry. They have an unbelievable understanding between them. You go with the, 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 the oncoming striker that way, leave the ball alone, I'll go with the ball. So you're coming in as a striker, you're ready to pounce, and this defender runs away with you without fouling you, without much of contact. He just distracts you, very technically. And this other defender has long gone with the ball and he's taken off. And guess what? You guys are now under attack. And that's where FC Barcelona's attack steals the limelight. Because now all guys see is Suarez. Mm. All guys think of is Messi. But look at that FC Barcelona defense and you begin to realize that seriously speaking, FC Barcelona are on another level. About tonight, it's 50-50. Yeah. And this, this clash between these two is like a derby. It's not even like an El Clasico anymore. It's like a derby. There's a grudge between these two sides that's normally restricted to intercity rivals. And unfortunately, as, as my friend has just put it here, FC Barcelona have been having the last laugh, the last laugh, the last laugh. But now what complicates it is the fact that they met just a, two, three days ago. So it's difficult to beat that same team again, especially 3-0. But now it's going to come down to Madrid. Can they rise to the occasion? Technically, I don't think they can. Well, Mr. since Ronaldo left, there has been much mm. talk over his possible replacements. A lot of mm. uh, players have been mentioned. Kylian mm. Mbappe, the wonder kid, now featuring for French money backs. Mm. Paris, Paris Saint Germain. Eden Hazard as well, mm. his name has been prominently featured. Paulo Dybala, mm. his name has also been mentioned with regards to whether they are likely candidates to replace Cristiano Ronaldo. Do you think the void he left has also affected the team's performance? And uh, even Suarez's performance during that El Classic? Copa del Rey return leg tie was fantastic and he rose to the occasion. He revived uh, his, you know, sparkling days mm. Uh, mm. back then because there has been also much talk over whether Suarez now is, is getting finished but pulled a surprise and defied all odds and performed better. Yes, you see, uh, I'll back them. Eh? <coughs> the midweek game between Barca and Madrid was a case of one team not taking their chances and the other team taking their chances. And I remember watching this game and, and saying to myself, Madrid have missed loads of chances in the first half. Barca have not even gotten theirs and if they get theirs, they are going to take them and they did. So this will be the same case. Madrid did not play that poorly. They were just mm. punished for their profligas in front of goal. Mm. So um, the likes of Vinicius, especially Vinicius, he is a very good player. You can see his movement, his ability to beat players on and off the ball, but his, his uh, finishing mm. still leaves a lot to be desired. I know he's a young player. He needs to do quite a lot. And I'll also add on what he said. Uh, the bus are back for Semedo, uh, PK, okay. Umtiti, and uh, Jordi Alba. Mm. That's a very good back for. 
no we can't call it the best back four in the world yeah. but they are a very good back four and especially PK and Umtiti they are not the hardest of center halves they don't hit hard they just mm -hmm. take you out of the game mm -hmm. and they do it in such a way uh, Umtiti does the taking out and PK carries the ball from the back point, point. yes mm -hmm. <laughs> point. Actually, that's how yeah. they do it, and it's so smooth. Yeah. Yeah. It's very smooth. And you would underrate them. Actually, I would uh, even point out if Maxwell's Man United was drawn against Barcelona, you'd think you'd beat that back four. But when that day comes, you realize the game is much difficult than you thought. So, actually, there is, um, there is that tendency of them getting it right in moments mm. at the back. And getting it right in moments at the front. They are not the machine they were under Enrique and Pep. Mm -hmm. But they are still a force to be reckoned with. Oh, so sure. for me, I think Barca still have the advantage going into tonight. Also not to forget the, the brilliance of uh, Tostegen, their keeper. He's been very good uh, with in instinctive saves. Good Benzema had a very good mm -hmm. chance during that game. But Actually, there was no way you beat Tostegen Another that guy, game. that back five is very underrated. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Tostegen is also a very good, there is a good goalkeeper in there. Mm. Yeah. Let, let's, let's now talk about the English Premier League title run. I know the favourites, Liverpool and Manchester City, closely following each other on 20 team uh, standings. Uh, they have been tipped, you know, mm. the heavyweights and they stand a chance to, either of them to win the uh, and lift the coveted uh, Premiership title but this particular afternoon Arsenal play Spurs Spurs were also mm. on the run to you know cause an upset and win English Premier League run but after their two consecutive losses we've heard from Mauricio Pochettino saying that now their title chase is over can we conclude so as well uh, as it is uh, Tottenham are more closer to the battle for top four positions uh, rather mm -hmm. than the other two uh, Premier League trailblazers trail trail who are Man City and Liverpool. Uh, a loss today against Arsenal and Tottenham are within a point of uh, this uh, top four battle between Man Manu mm -hmm. and Chelsea and Arsenal and now Spurs mm -hmm. if they lose tonight. So Tottenham had a really good thing going for them. They would uh, mm -hmm. given themselves a distance between, but in the last two games where they've lost, they, they were 10 points ahead of, of the rest of the top four chasers. But they lost against Burnley, first of all, and uh, also against uh, Chelsea in midweek. So Tottenham's, uh, the, the thing I see with Tottenham is the players are getting tired. Because you have this core of players, whether it's Christian Eriksen, it's uh, Vatongen, it's uh, Toby. There are people who play week in, week out, and they mm. are also playing on several fronts in the Champions League. Mm. Uh, they're playing there. So there's that element of fatigue coming in where the Tottenham players don't just apply themselves as they, they apply. Remember, Pochettino also plays a very high-intensity game where the players mm. uh, press, press as much off yes. the ball as they also attack with speed. So uh, they are doing, I think, it's tiredness. They have a slim squad right now. They don't have that depth that City and uh, Liverpool have. So as it is, they are out of contention for the Premier League and also mm. in, in jeopardy for the top four positions as it is. Good news to Kenyan football following, of course, the national team. Arambe Stars keeper Victor Onyama is starting uh, this particular afternoon. And in Arsenal, of course, Mesut Ozil was so impressive in midweek against Bournemouth. I think he scored a brace. Uh, he scored one, he assisted one, or he scored a brace. Either way. And uh, Pierre M. R. Abomayang, the Gabonese international, is also mm. on the bench. The two dynamics, Wanyama starting and the absence of uh, the duo of Ozil and Abomayang. Well, the thing about a derby, really, and this is a derby, mm. and a very fierce and intense derby, mm. it's not so much about who's playing and who's not playing. It's about the pride of your neck of the woods. It's about the intensity, the traditional rivalry of a derby. There's few derbies in England that come close to Tottenham versus Arsenal. And I think it's the biggest London derby. So if we remove Wanyama, in as much as I'd want to debate about Wanyama, I'd want to throw in Aubameyang and, and whoever else, I'm looking at it as a derby. This is going to be as intense as it gets. And I have no favorite winner or favorite loser. I think it's going to be a draw, mm. essentially because the the stage 
this league has reached so far, we're now looking at the last 10 games, we're almost near the penultimate stage. Mm, yes. The last five games are going to be so critical. And you start winning those last five games now. Why? Because from here, it's all about psychology. You had a debate here with um, Mulama a few weeks ago about banter. Now, this is where the banter really picks. <laughs> this is where you're going to win on psychology. Because the games that have been played so far in the season, those have there's nothing you can do about them. You've won, you've drawn, you've lost. But remarkably, Tottenham is one side that can rise to the occasions if and need be. And Arsenal is also a side that can rise to the occasion if and need be. And now here is a, a situation whereby, based on the fact that it's a derby, both of them are forced to rise to the occasion. Mm. If this game was being played at Arsenal's staff, Arsenal would have the slight home advantage edge. But it's not. It's being played not at White Hart Lane, but at Wembley. White Hart Lane is Tottenham's traditional home ground, but now of late Wembley has been their home ground. So they, they are kind of familiar with it, and it kind of gives them the home feeling. Even their fans feel, you guys cannot come here and beat us here. So that's, that's where the intensity of the rivalry is going to be felt. And based on the fact, like I've just said, it's not going to be at the Emirates, so I cannot tip Arsenal to win. I'm going for a draw. You're going for a draw. Webster, Spurs against Arsenal at Wembley. Mm. And, and Unai Emery has been accused by several Arsenal supporters of lacking sort of a specific playing format. We associated Arsene Wenger, your former coach with you know, sexy football, uh, that, that resembles the style of Barcelona. But nowadays, uh, you what's see, happening? You see, um, with Unai Emery, I fail to understand why people... Let me, let me put it in black and white. You know, the, the Arsenal fans who are throwing barbs at Emery are just... They, they are just incensed because Emery has dropped Mesut Ozil and Aaron Ramsey. And you see, Maxwell, yes. uh, in the Arsenal fan base, we have this, uh, we, we have this uh, cluster. They, they, they are like gangs where a certain group of Arsenal fans worship a certain player. And uh, players who have been guilty of such worship are Ozil and Aaron Ramsey. You see? And when they are not dropped, Emery is not the popular person. You see? And another thing, um, Maxwell... Yes. There are those majority Arsenal fans who feel Genduzi is getting more game time than he deserves. You see? And to me, it doesn't make sense. And you see, we gave Arsene Wenger 12 years to try and fix this up. He didn't. After six months, we are already complaining about Emery. It's what not they fair. did, yeah, exactly, it's not absolutely, fair. it's not fair. People, what they should do is manage their expectations. I think this 21 game unbeaten streak was a curse. <laughs> because people all of a sudden thought, hey, we could win the league, we could win even the Champions League, even though we are not in it. You see, now those kind of things, you need to remember you're in transition. This is a Wenger team. It's still Wenger's team, with the exception of uh, Socrates and Torreira and Licksteiner and Leno. And Genduzi. And then there's an elephant in the room, uh, sorry to budge in, mm. that people are not talking of. This could be the weekend that Manchester United now come into the top four. Yes. Because if Arsenal fail to win, mm -hmm. then, given the fact that they're just one point ahead of United, mm. United then go on to win this weekend, they'll come into the top four. Yes. Once they're in the top four, getting them out of that top four, it's going to be a crunch and don't forget of a United travel to Arsenal next weekend. Uh -huh. mm. So, so, mm. so this is it. So there are two <laughs> kinds of scenarios here. There is a English Premier League title a chess, mm -hmm. the crown and the desperation for two a city looking forward to retain the title and Liverpool after you know several years of waiting, seeking to record history and win it. Then there is talk for finish. To qualify for Champions League football next season. I'm talking about the same, of course, United are playing 
uh, Southampton this particular evening at 6 p.m. The fixtures lined up this particular afternoon. Spurs, of course, against Arsenal. That's a North London derby happening in a few minutes from now as we speak at the Wembley Stadium. Bournemouth against Manchester City. Remember, Bournemouth got beaten by Arsenal 5-1 and they will be having another Aculean task against uh, PL title favourites and Brighton against Huddersfield. Burnley against Crystal Palace. Wolverhampton Wanderers against Cardiff. Cardiff got beaten mm. by some team. Around it was 5-1. Mm. By Watford, 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 Watford yeah. and then yeah. West Ham United play Newcastle. You are passionate uh, uh, fan of Oleguna Solskjaer. Mm -hmm. Do you still believe the Norwegian international should be retained in permanent capacity as a tactician for Man United, despite the talk of Mauricio Pochettino coming to take over next season? I see no reason why he should not be retained. Mm. If we want to live in a world of fairness and keep up to the slogan of football that says fair play give the man a chance sign him on board permanently which is what i said here on i think it was the 22nd of december 2018 even before he had started the work proper yeah. I, I was for it and i gave my reasons why i don't think for the sake of time i'll, I'll repeat them because i've repeated them over and over since uh, so far so good. This is the watershed weekend. He could come into the top four now. Remember, he started by winning and winning and winning, but still remained in position six. So the banter was, ah ha ha, <laughs> Badumko sixth. Then he came fifth. And he also got to fourth at some point. And mm. he, he, got, mm. he got to fourth briefly, but he came to fifth. Mm. And that ha ha ha, Badumko sixth came to eh. <laughs> um, Actually, he, he stuck to the basics of football. And now and he's yeah. getting the guys yeah. to play to their abilities. And is he is he emulating everything, Sir Alex Ferguson? Exactly, to, absolutely. To did you know Sir Alex Ferguson mentors some of his players, and I don't think there is any other manager who has produced players who have gone to be coaches more than Sir Alex. And you know what the band, uh, not banter, what the talk <laughs> is actually, is that mm. Sir Alex Ferguson still puts on his kit and comes in to train with, with the lads. Mm. Of course, with Solskjaer next to him, and he, gi he guides him, he gives him tips. Mm. That's, unlike, that's unlike, what people unlike, are unlike when the likes of Mourinho and Luis Van yeah. Gaal were at the helm, mm -hmm. is it because mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to work independently? No. Well, Sir Alex Ferguson respects Van Gaal and Mourinho as world-class managers. So he lets them do their job. And also Mourinho, the connection. Yes. And you know, remember Van Hal and Mourinho are Champions League yeah. winners. This is his Just baby. like Sir Alex. So he will let... Soldier is... Exactly. Is baby. Soldier is his baby. He mm. brought him to the English Premier League. He mm. is the one who gave him the career he had as a footballer. And he's the one who's been mentoring him as a manager. Just and like, most likely exactly. the one who recommended him. Yeah, and just to mention off, off uh, just to go offside a little bit, for example, do you know who is mentoring uh, Wool, Wool, the Wolves manager Nuno Santo Espirito? It's Jose Mourinho. Mm. Yes. That is why when you see Wolves playing, you get the feeling you can see a Mourinho in mm. It's a Mourinho team because if you concede against them, you'll have problems. Sure. Yeah. So it's happening. We're gonna we're gonna wind up, but before we do, of course, some incident happened uh, on Sunday last week. Uh, Chelsea Football Club <laughs> up against <laughs> Man City <laughs> in the final <laughs> <laughs> of Carabao Cup. And I was watching Sky Sports and I was watching pundits, uh, both John Terry alongside uh, uh, who former Manchester City defender now playing at West Ham. This agent in international mm. Z uh, Pablo Zabaleta, Pablo and they were saying if they were captains on that particular day they would have gotten to the field and remove Kepa after his refusal to get substituted <laughs> just a few minutes mm. before penalty shootouts what will you have done Mose? Um, <laughs> is that in discipline directed to the coach does that mean that the coach has failed Mauricio sorry sorry to stamp authority as the tactician so um what happened with Chelsea is uh what's happening in football today the players are becoming more powerful than, than the, the players coaches. before when you substitute a player, you come out, whether you agree with that, that substitution choice or you don't, mm. you come out. But in this case, Kepa just refused to come out. 
the captain of the day, uh, as Pilikweta, didn't do much to help the situation. So, Mauricio, Mauricio David Sari, is trying to talk yes, to him casually. The and, and then you see, mm. th that's another thing, there's no leadership in Chelsea Football Club right yes. now. Because such a fuss in your team already gives you that psychological uh, edge. Mm. And uh, I think that's why they, they ended up losing the game. I think uh, that's an element of it. So, um, player power clearly manifested there, but it was out of order for Kepa to refuse to come out of the game at that particular time. And we saw during that subsequent game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, against Spurs, now he had to be rested. Willy Caballero, former Manchester City custodian, had to start. Will that situation continue as uh, yes, a, a reason for you know it, and it punishment should. to Kepa? It should. Because you see, these players need to know their lane and stick to it. And that is what made Alex Ferguson a top class manager and a legend of the game. He used to say no player is bigger than Manchester United. Mm. So Maurizio Sarri should make sure no player is bigger than Chelsea Football Club. That is why most Arsenal fans are mad because Unai Emery drops Mesut Ozil. No player is bigger than Arsenal Football Club. Period. Period. No player is bigger yes, it's than, than a club. Of course, that brings us to the end of the show. It's been an epic one. Every Saturday, one to three touchline on Y25. For myself, alongside Robert Osoro, will be taking you through. Of course, we're going to do this next time, same time, same place. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on board. Moses, uh, Tiras, and Webster coming through and putting things into perspective as far as Matters International Football is concerned. And to our crew, salute for a well done job. Keep it's it an all sporty crew and have a fantastic weekend. It's an all girl crew <laughs> behind the camera. I did notice that. <laughs> 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 you are a lover boy, you say it. So. I did say so. You've just justified <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. what you said. Thank you for tuning in and have a blessed weekend. Stay tuned and keep it sporty. <laughs>